Okay, so welcome to Nano Session. It will be co-presented by uh, two PowerShell MVPs or Cloud Data Center uh, and Management uh, MVPs. Uh, my name is uh, Alexander Nikolic. I'm a Cloud Data Center uh, Management MVP and also a Azure uh, MVP. I'm a co-founder of PowerShellMagazine.com and a community manager of PowerShell.com. And here's my colleague. Yeah, my name is Jan. I'm uh, also a Cloud Data Center MVP from Norway. I've got a company called Creo. I'm also a contributor and editor at the PowerShell Magazine. Yeah. So the agenda for today is a really brief introduction. What is the nano server? I hope that you are already familiar with it. But uh, I mean, let's let's check. How many of you are familiar with nano server? Good. How many of you have implemented nano server in production in your environment? Okay. I emphasize that production really, right? And no hands, which is really interesting, really, right? Uh, so we can talk about how to manage nano server and show you some of the different management techniques that we have and uh, We'll talk about the service management tools, which is uh, a web-based uh, suite of different management tools hosted in Azure and talk a little bit about what happened behind the scenes and then a little bit of nano server and uh, container uh, story so uh, when we talk about nano, one thing that's come to mind right now is that publicly we are not sure what's going on right now with nano server because nothing happened after GA, right? They released nano in October and since October there is nothing new, right? It's a kind of a silence, so people are confused what's going on there, right? And to be honest, we are confused as speakers as well. Uh, what can I tell you? I mean, some of the things that we know we, we cannot share, but uh, it's, it, it is a little bit strange because uh, there was a huge hype around the story of, of nano server, right? And then suddenly after GA, there is nothing, just kind of a silence. So, so we have some time to learn about it more. And uh, when I think about nano server as, a, as they call it, a like new installation option of, of Windows Server, right? And in the Microsoft vision, it looked like that's the future of Windows Server. This is where we are going, right? In enterprises, we are going to that headless uh, server. Then if you need to support legacy applications, then you should deploy a server core. If you talk about cloud-based applications or cloud-born applications and all those new things, then you should think about nano server. And uh, as we have seen just a minute ago, no one is using it in production, which is kind of an interesting thing, right? But like, why is that? Do you think the problem is that it's hard to manage? Or is it a lack of feature that are supported there? Uh, probably both of them, right? Because uh, it's interesting that the community still kind of doesn't get it because one of the Number one features on the user voice for it is uh, Active Directory domain services, right? So like people like to run a SQL and I, I very frequently I'm asked like, can I run Oracle on it? Right, so like people are not getting it. They, they want to have the old server to support all the things that they had before, but at the same time to have something that it's really small and, and, and very new written from scratch and with absolutely different scenarios in the mind, right? One of the challenges that we have is the management part of the story, right? Because you cannot do the interactive logging to a nano server. You cannot RDP to a nano server. How many of you are still managing your servers using RDP? No. And I, I'm pretty sure that the other half that didn't show up hands uh, was not honest. Let's put it that way, right? Because we all know that still, at least for certain servers or a certain task, we use RDP to connect to a service, right? We would like to sometimes PowerShell, right? I think in this at this conference in this room, we have a pretty big percentage of users that use actually PowerShell to manage servers, right? 
But when you go to uh, any other conference that it's not strictly focused on PowerShell, and you ask them the same question, if they're really honest, you will get 100% of hands, right? Uh, even in this room with all the people that like PowerShell, really, you are here because you are passionate about PowerShell, you are here because you use it probably on a daily basis, you're interested. Even if you don't use it, you're interested to improve your knowledge of it. So you would prefer to use PowerShell to manage it, but still you might find it kind of a difficult or challenging. Not acceptable. Can you tell me why? Seriously, that's just amazing for me. Uh, I would like to, you, if your security guys can talk to our security guys here, that would be interesting talk. Because every time when I heard that kind of argument, I ask people like, do you really think that in your company you have a better security experts than Microsoft? I mean, seriously. If Microsoft thinks that remoting is not, partial remoting is not secure, do you think that they will enable secure, uh, partial remoting by default since server 2012? I mean, really? If anyone in Microsoft, in security teams there, thought that the partial remoting is not secure, it will not be enabled by default, really. And if you think about it, the PowerShell management is probably the most secure way to manage your servers. It's interesting that your security guys don't have anything against RDP. Right? They didn't disallow RDP in your organization, right? Okay. Yeah, sure. You know that we are recording the session. <laughs> I don't need to tell anyone anything. Okay. So, right, good. Because we are, we are counting on that that they are slow, right? They are a little bit behind. But I can argue with you, for example, that PowerShell remoting is a new feature, right? Because we got it with PowerShell 2. So uh, I remember that we have a huge discussions at the beginning. In PowerShell 2 with remoting, there were a huge discussion about security and, and remoting. And today you can actually, even if you just do a basic search with your favorite search engine, whatever you prefer, uh, you will find some articles that will give you good arguments why is PowerShell and PowerShell emoting the most secure way to manage your servers, really? And I, th I think that just recently, Lee Holmes, the guy who is behind PowerShell security and now enterprise and cloud security inside of, of Microsoft, has written a blog post comparing PowerShell to other scripting languages from the point of security. And you should read that one, and you should actually forward that link to your security guys if they still think that the remoting is not the best way to manage servers in your environment. Seriously, uh, I mean, uh, as you know that PowerShell remoting was not enabled by default. One of the reasons was that, I'm, I, I don't know that for sure, but I'm kind of a guessing. One of the reasons was that the security guys inside of a Microsoft were not that assured that it is the most secure way. So they said, like, let's not push that immediately to our customers. Let's see how it works and stuff. But with Server 2012 and the newer ones, we want our servers to be available for remote management immediately. And with nano server, that's actually crucial because there is no any other way. 
Uh, this year, uh, Jan and I presented a, one interesting session. I think it, it's interesting uh, at the NIC conference in Oslo. And the title for it was Nano Server Management for GUI Lovers. And we focused on, on GUI tools because uh, Microsoft did a lot to enable remote management with the GUI tools. But to enable those GUI tools to work properly, you still need to understand the behind the scenes remoting that it's included in that story. So in a domain environment, everything will work nicely and those GUI tools will work. But if you need to target, for example, a server that's in a work group environment in your enterprise, you will need to understand what's going on and why you cannot connect immediately because, for example, the Kerberos doesn't work. So you need to go with the changing trusted host list and you need to understand PowerShell remoting. So at the end, you will do some of the PowerShell remoting tasks to enable that GUI tool to work remotely for your junior admins or the admins that still prefer click, those Mr. Clickers that just want to go next, next, next through things, right? So every time when we, when we look even through GUI tools, we can see that the remoting runs underneath, right? Behind the scenes. So this is, this is where we are going. And I think after 10 years of PowerShell, it's kind of a terrible that we still have that discussion. Like, is PowerShell remoting secure? Is that the best way to manage our servers? Uh, when we get back to the story of a nano server, that's not the only way, but it's still just like recommended and the best way to do it. Uh, they actually is extending that remote management to some new things, and we will, we will, manage, uh, we will manage, uh, mention them very briefly here that uh, the PowerShell remoting is the most important thing, but you can also use the same sessions. How many of you are familiar with the WMI and SIM? Oh, that's, that's good, that's good. But still, I would like to see 100 hands because WMI is the old technology. It's with us since NT4. I don't think that we have a lot of people in a room except me that still remember those days, but okay, a couple of us. But uh, WMI is with us and it's super powerful and things change enormously with PowerShell 3 when they introduced SIM commandlets. And they introduced not just generic SIM commandlets, they introduced a bunch of a thousands of commandlets that are based on a SIM and you can use them with the same sessions. For that thing to, to work, you don't even need to have PowerShell remoting enabled. If you find that information somewhere and you will find it, that's the wrong information. You need VNRM remoting. PowerShell remoting is another layer on that, in that story, and you don't need it for, power, for SIM. So SIM is super powerful because it works, again, as a PowerShell remoting over WS man. It works over standard protocols and all that story. And people are not using it. They have those commandlets on their own machine, and they're not using them. It's just amazing to me that they are not using it. But with Nano, you need to. And, and the coverage is, is just amazing because every single new feature has now support with a PowerShell module. Microsoft product groups are not allowed anymore to release a new technologies and new server tools without support for a PowerShell. This is where we are now. It was different before, right? But today, this is how it goes. You install a feature, you get PowerShell module. Then we can use PowerShell DSC as a configuration management for nano server in everything else. What is really interesting that everything that we will mention today can be applied to nano, but can be applied to any other installation option. It can be also applied to those down level server operating systems. So they did, they did a lot of things to enable better management of nano server, but the benefit is everywhere. So even if you don't plan or you are not using at all nano server right now, you can leverage all of these techniques that we mentioned to manage servers in your system. Uh, nano actually pushed them to, to, to create that experience better. So you might have known that um, we now can use a PS edit function in ISC to edit remote files. Do you know that? So it works now remotely. You create interactive remote session, 
Then you start PS edit, you target a machine that it's on a remote machine, you get it not in the read mode view, you get it in edit view, in edit mode, you change the things there, you save the file, and the file is saved on the remote side. It's mostly created to support nano server, but you can use it targeting others. That would be the desktop experience or a server core, okay? So a, a lot of things that change in that remoting scenarios were forced by development of nano, but we can use it with other things as well. So that, that's why it's also very important to go to nano server sessions to read the documentation about nano, because everything there you can apply to something else as well. We have partial web access as well. We have a, a partial direct. How many of you are familiar with that amazing feature called partial direct? Like a, like a third of you. All right. So the partial direct is a feature created by Hyper-V team. And it allows you as a Hyper-V administrator to go from a Hyper-V host into your VM and execute partial commands there without any dependency on a network stack on a WinRM service. So that's a, a crucial feature for hosters. In case that your tenants make some mistake and disable a network adapter or just mess up with the network stack so that they cannot connect there anymore, you can connect that. And if you enable a GIA endpoint there before so that they are as a tenants assured that you will not go anywhere you like, but you will just connect to that uh, VM and have a restricted environment with just a couple of functions available to you to fix a networking stack, they can be assured that you cannot look at the files that are there on that VM. It's super powerful. Just amazing feature. Unfortunately, people are still not aware of that. One of the, the uh, let's say problems right now, they only support Windows Server 2016 with it and uh, Windows 10. But they might support it for down-level uh, operating systems in the future as well, we will see. So when you work with the nano VMs, that's, that's really very, very interesting, important. Okay, question. No, I'm not aware. They might do something, but I'm not aware. So we might return actually to this uh, SMT architecture or I might rely that you will remember the things that I will show you before we go to a, to a demo. But let me just kind of a, give you a little bit of an overview of the things. Uh, this feature called Server Management Tools is uh, part of Azure Portal. So it's a cloud-based, uh, you go to Azure Portal, so you manage machines from a web browser. And uh, it works in a way that you need to define a gateway on your network. And the gateway will make connection to Azure Portal. But then that gateway will, will actually pass commands to your managed nodes. Those managed nodes can be nano servers, can be a full server server with desktop experience, and can be some older operating systems as well. They started just support just because of a nano, and the things that they enable there are just now kind of very uh, amazing to me because now you can run registry editor in a web browser. You can run task manager and device manager, all those tools in a web browser. You can think about this feature as some kind of server manager 2.0, okay? And we will talk about it more and it will be easier for you to kind of get it when we go to a uh, actual GUI and then show you how it works. But now we will move to a demo part and Jan will take over. Do you hear me? Yeah. Great. All right, so I'm going to talk about some management techniques that we can use to manage nano server. It's not specific to nano, it will work for a server with a desktop or server core as well, but uh, since nano is a headless server, uh, it's a good scenario for these things. So I will start by giving some uh, DSC related demos. How many here are familiar with the basics of desired state configurations? More than half the room. So that's that's great because I'm assuming that you have some basic DSC knowledge here. So for those of you who don't, uh, 
I apologize, but I'm just going to the dive into uh, a demo describing how you can leverage DSC to bootstrap a new uh, nano VM. So the concept here is that you first create your nano server VM. Uh, the documentation is online on TechNet or docsmicrosoft.com. Uh, when you have a VHDX file, you or if you are using a server with a desktop, you typically sysprep it and shut it down so it's ready for use. So if you uh, think of this VHDX file as a, a generalized file that we want to use as an image for new uh, virtual machines, uh, I'm going to do something called bootstrapping here. So the LCM contains of or the desired state configuration, local configuration manager. Uh, contains uh, some settings that you can use to point it to different uh, uh, pull servers for getting its uh, configuration. Let's just see if we can reconnect to the demo environment. No, you, you will lost connection. Okay, we lost connection with the. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this one. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to open the VHDX file. We're going to inject a .mop file containing settings for the DSC LCM so that on the initial boot, it will automatically connect to a pull server and get its uh, configuration dynamically. Let's just see if uh, we can reconnect here. So here I'm going to double click on the VHDX file just to show you where the location is. So here I'm basically into the operating system drive for the image uh, and it's under system 32 and configuration. So here we have two files we can inject. We have uh, pending.mof if you have a full DSC configuration compiled, we could inject that in here. But uh, generally the idea of injecting a full configuration, uh, it's, it's uh, more suitable to just uh, have it more dynamically so that you just bootstrap the DSC client against a pull server and it gets its full configuration from there. Uh, it's the same idea as you have a thick image or a thi uh, thin image, the same thought, benefits of having a, a thin image. So that was uh, kind of the basics regarding sysprep and what we are going to do here. So if we go right into the demo, uh, here I have uh, some code that we are going to share with you uh, after the conference. Uh, it's a module where I created some custom uh, PowerShell functions that we're going to use for this demo. So if we hop into the new PSCon Piper VVM, I'm going to show the technique that we are using. This is just a very simple function I'm using in my home lab environment for spinning up new VMs based on a base image. So I'm using a differencing disk uh, when creating new VMs, so it's very fast to spin up new VMs when you want to test things. So the first part of the code is not very interesting for this uh, topic, uh, but uh, what's relevant here is the, if you have specified a DSC meta configuration parameter on the new PSConf Hyper-V VM function, you're going to do exactly what I did in the GUI. I'm going to mount the file uh, using mount disk image. I'm going to figure out what is the drive letter of the mounted file and then I'm going to wait a few seconds for it to become available in PowerShell because that takes a few seconds before it shows up as a PS drive. When it does that, I construct a path to the Windows System 32 configuration path where is where I'm going to inject the metaconfig file and then I'm just doing a copy, copy item and co copying the file that I specified on the parameter. When I've done that, I'm just dismounting it and uh, starting the VM. So what I did there was basically create a new VM, mount uh, the VHDX file and inject the meta config in, into the new VM. So let's uh, go ahead and actually use this so we'll, we'll see how it works in action. So here I'm going to use a pre-configured meta.mof file. I have a pre-configured nano VM.vhdx file which is just a general, generalized image for nano server. Let's just have a quick look at the meta.mof file, but this is not something you have to know, but here is the, the details for, for example, the Azure Automation pull server I'm using in this scenario. This could have been an on-premise pull server if you want to use that, but for this demo I'm using uh, Azure Automation. 
the registration key for it to bootstrap and also in here I have specified what configuration should it pull down from the server. So for example if this was a new Hyper-V host I could have created a configuration called psconfeu.hyper-v and dynamically injected that uh, uh, configuration name uh, as part of the bootstrapping. So let's just go out of this one and uh, create a new VM called psconfeu demo one so if we look in Hyper-V Manager now, it will first it will ask me where what disk I want to put it on. I'll pick the one with the most free disk space, and we should see a new VM spin up here, and it will soon start. And at the first start, when the typically on the, when the sysprep uh, process is finished and the VM is spin up with a new name and all those things, uh, also the DSC will uh, engine will kick off and see if it, there are any MOF files waiting, for example, pending.mof or metaconfig.mof. So here we can see that the VM is currently starting up. So uh, if we go into the Azure portal and uh, look at Azure Automation, as you probably know, you can use Azure Automation as a DSC pool server. So that's exactly what I've done here. So here I have a pre-configured automation account. And here we can see that there are currently nine DSC nodes in uh, this automation account. So the VM that is coming up very soon, it's the host name is the, just nano-vm. It should become uh, available in the portal very shortly because we saw that the VM is up and running. You can see the very exciting nano server recovery console here. This is nano server. <laughs> and uh, if we go back here, we should see that it, uh, there we have it, nano-vm. There you can see that it applied or downloaded the psconf.eu.base config that I specified inside of the MOF file dynamically. And here you can drill down and see what settings was applied. But for example, this could be a role-based configuration for, you have, I'm sure you have different server roles in your environment. So you can specify during provisioning that this server will get this config and so on. Uh, so that's the bootstrapping process, uh, the power of injecting a LCM configuration during uh, VM provisioning or physical host for that matter. Uh, you can use the exact same technique, I use it uh, at a customer actually, if you use Virtual Machine Manager to deploy Hyper-V hosts, you have this bare metal deployment feature in Virtual Machine Manager where you can provision physical computers as Hyper-V servers. Uh, then you will basically pixaboot the server, the physical machine, against a VMM server, and it will download a VHDX file which it will apply from the VMM library. So here we have, uh, for example, a demo a computer profile I set up. So it's basically just a VHDX file as well. So imagine that you have a standardized DSC configuration for all of your Hyper-V hosts, then you can inject that MOF file into the VMM VHDX files that will be used for uh, deploying all of your Hyper-V servers. And the good thing about this is that also if you apply new changes to the configuration later, you decide to performance in our tune some performance settings for Hyper-V or whatever, you apply that to the configuration in Azure Automation and the node will automatically get the new updates. So for example, you can stop using group policy if you rather want to use a more modern management technology, because as you probably know, a group policy is not supported on nano server. You can join it to the domain, but it won't retrieve any of the group policy settings because it has no group policy client in it. So if you're using nano as a Hyper-V host, uh, DSC is the optimal uh, management technique in, in my eyes. The second thing I wanted to show you in uh, the first demo regarding DSC, the, that is how you can uh, apply security settings on Nano because as I just said, you can't use group policy as you have probably done earlier. For example, if you go into the group policy console, you are, I'm sure you have some baseline group policies configuring much of the settings we can see here for auditing, for user rights assignment and, and so on, but that's not possible to apply to nano server using a group policy. So that's when you can use the new security commandlets that was introduced in uh, nano server. So you will notice that you have this module called security commandlets that contains the four commandlets that you see here. 
And what this makes it possible to do is to back up and restore policies from a baseline machine. So for example, if this machine was a baseline machine, I could have configured things like I want in the console here. Um, tune everything, uh, maybe configure all the same settings that I have in my group policy in the domain environment. Then I can go ahead and do a backup of uh, the local configuration. So it will be backed up to a file that will be applied using the side state configuration. So there are also some accompanying uh, modules for DSC here, for example, all those uh, that you can see here, security policy, DSC and so on, so they basically contain DSC resources for uh, restoring uh, the things that you have uh, created from a baseline image. So for example here, if you look at uh, the security policy, uh, if we define this variable, and um, let's say that we are run backup security policy, and uh, here we can look at how that file looks like. It's basically just an in file with the settings for password, history, and so on. All of the things that you can configure in the GUI are now in this in file that will be applied using DSC. Uh, same thing for auditing, only it's a CSV file instead of an in file. Uh, and also for the registry uh, settings, things that are in administrative templates uh, are created in this registry.pol file. That's, I think it's a binary file, so it's no point in opening it uh, in, uh, in this editor. Uh, so based on these uh, things I have done here, I've created some baseline settings. I can create a desired state configuration uh, using the DSC resources that we saw. So here is the sample configuration I prepared. It's called psconf EU. Uh, in the beginning, I'm importing the necessary DSC resources. And here I've created the base config. Uh, this is for Azure Automation. So the node name is the name of the config that you want to upload to Azure Automation. Uh, so here, for example, the security template. This is uh, a single instance. That means, for example, if you think about a time zone, a server can have only one time zone. It's the same thing here. It can contain only one instance of a security template. That's why you have this is single instance. The other settings for this resource is basically just pointing to the in file because that's where our, all of the settings are residing. Same thing for audit policy, the registry policy, but for the user right assignment, you have more granular control. Here you can set the specific or the individual settings inside of the DSC resource. So this is actually the, the configuration that was applied in uh, Azure Automation, uh, in the Azure Automation configuration, psconf eu.baseconfig, so that's the thing that we just looked at. So if we look in the report here in the, in the console, we can see that all of the three, four resources was, is now compliant because it has uh, applied all of the settings. Uh, I can also show you, uh, if you go into the VM that was deployed, the NanoServer VM, if you go into that from a regular PowerShell host, where I have the credential object ready, so I don't type it incorrectly. Uh, here we can inspect the DSC local configuration manager. So basically, what was in the in file that now, oh, excuse me, what was in the meta.mof file that we injected to the VM during provisioning? That oh, that is all of the settings that, that you can see here. So the URL to the Azure Automation build server. It's inside of this uh, settings object. We can also, for example, do a test DSE configuration. And then we should see that uh, the whole configuration is applied. The security template with the int file, the audit policy with the CSV file and so on. So now we have a fully configured nano server uh, from a security perspective with all our uh, auditing uh, settings and so on. So you can see that this machine is now in a desired state. So that's basically the DSC demos. Now I'm going to hand it over to Alexander for some SMT commandlet demos. Okay. So I can watch Jan demoing things for hours and everything looks so easy when he's doing it. All right. So uh, let's switch uh, here to uh, SMT. Uh, to show you how that works. So uh, when you want to add a machine to be managed with the server management tools, 
you will add first the node, and then if you don't have a gateway, and usually you don't have it that you, if you do it for the first time, then you will need to go through some steps to uh, promote one of your machines in your own environment to be the SMT gateway. Uh, they will generate a, a zip file for you that you need to uh, 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 unblock and uh, expand on your own machine, and then it contains the MSI file and the JSON config file. Uh, it's, it's generated for you dynamically, and I think it's valid for an hour or, or a couple of hours. So then when you uh, install it, your machine is promoted to a SMT gateway, and when you return to your managed node, then the managed node actually knows how to connect and communicate to Azure, Azure portal. So uh, once when you have it, when you go to your uh, node, and the environment that I have here is the, the test domain in uh, Azure, with the domain controller, a member server, a client server, and a nano server. Okay. So I'm getting here uh, to a nano server. If everything works okay, I should get a connection to it. And then you can see that here we have uh, lots of those tools that never worked before remotely, and now not even that they are working remotely, but they are working in a browser, right? which is just amazing if you ask me. And we have some echo here from this microphone, so I'll switch it off. So we have a certificate manager and device manager, event viewer, a file explorer, firewall rules. If my machine is a Hyper-V, then I can have access to some uh, Hyper-V management uh, things here. Look at the local uh, administrators, network settings, all the other stuff. Even Windows Update is here, but one thing, that because it's a PowerShell conference, I think we should concentrate on a PowerShell here. And the cool thing is that we have a PowerShell console inside of uh, SMT tools, and you can work and think about it very similar way as we, when we work with the uh, PowerShell Web Access kind of thing. It's based on a different technique behind the scenes, but the experience is pretty much uh, the same. And I will just want to show you that if you are here, I mean, you can run whatever you want, and uh, you can even get a, a tab completion. So the, what we have here is uh, PowerShell 5.1. I want to uh, create a variable here just to show you something that uh, I think it's cool. And uh, so, not this, this is better. So PSCon of EU, we created now a variable in this session. And I will now switch to one of my other servers in domain to, to see how they look at this session that it's created against my nano server, right? And uh, if I do that here, I have this, no, that's you. And, uh, okay, I need to reconnect to my machine. B. What is that one? So I think that's the one. Connect. So when I connect to my uh, one of the member servers that I have in that domain environment, I can use get ps session, computer name, the name of my nano server, to see how it looks like from their perspective and do they see some sessions, remote partial remoting sessions on nano server. As you can see here, uh, there is one that it's actually now in disconnected state. And th that one is actually that session that you have seen in a console in SMT tools. So I can connect to that session from this machine and check if that variable that I've created it is available to me or any other things that I created in that session. Okay. So uh, I can connect to uh, nano. Uh, ID is nine. So now I'm connected to that session, and if everything worked as I expected, I have access to that variable. So whatever I executed inside of that web browser session and the PowerShell console there, it's not just for that environment. It's just the regular disconnected PowerShell session that I can connect to from the other machines as well. I never seen someone demoing this kind of thing, but when we look at what's happening behind the scenes of all that stuff, it's all, 
this will be kind of a cool demo to show, really. Because to support uh, all these things, they uh, added a new WMI providers and uh, some other things uh, as well. But you don't need to know all that stuff to actually leverage them. What is really interesting is that uh, when they enabled service management tools, and that feature is, I haven't mentioned, that's still in preview. It's free, and I think that will be free even when it's completely done. So you can try it even if you don't want to spend any money with Azure. You will just create a trial uh, Azure uh, account subscription and then use that feature just to see how it works. So with all the GUI support for the tool, we also got commandlets for it. We have a question here. Oh, 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 okay. Interesting. Okay. Well. Okay. Let me try then. You're right. Let me see how it looks like now. So now they all open. Yeah, the, 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 the ID number is, yeah. So, uh, okay, okay, we can we can check because what I did with connection, I actually uh, didn't specify for connection the ID. So I connected with the uh, with uh, I just saying like connect to anything that it's available, and that disconnected session was available, so I connected to that session. So here in in this yes in this line. I connected, I didn't for a connecting provide ID. And that ID also changes, right? So don't rely on ID, usually, seriously. Uh, I mean, when you work with disconnected uh, PowerShell remoting sessions, try to give them a name, okay? And here they are calling those server management tools. That's the name, oh, with spaces. Oh, come on, they need to fix that. <laughs> I mean, that's not how you do with stuff. So uh, not just the GUI things, but they also provide uh, SMT commandlets for it. And I want to give you a really short demo of the things that you can do with the commandlets. You need to use, uh, those commandlets are part of the Azure uh, RM modules. There is one module called Azure RM Server Management. You need to authenticate to Azure. I did that uh, before. And I will just uh, show you that you can work with the sessions, uh, execute some commands, and this is what we will do. Uh, work with those managed nodes. Uh, there are certain things that are not still supported. Uh, fortunately, the promotion of a machine to server management tools gateway is still not supported from a PowerShell uh, commandlets, but I hope they will add that because uh, if you want to automate things, you need support for the PowerShell. You don't need to go there and download file and then copy there and, and do the installation. They need to do it in, in a better way. I think that I have this uh, credentials already there, yes. So what I need to do is I need to create a server management session. For that I need to uh, specify a resource group name because in RM everything is uh, organized in resource groups. Uh, give uh, the IP address of a node name and uh, provide some credentials. So if everything works, okay, I will get this session. Don't be alarmed that this is not PowerShell remoting session. Okay, this is a different kind of a session. You can see that even when you look at the properties. So then I will define some properties that I need for executing a command against it. I need a resource group name, a node name, session name, and the actual command. I'm going really simple here with just the host name, nothing more than that. And then I have this uh, easy to remember commandlet called invoke Azure RM server management PowerShell tool. Uh, no, PowerShell command, I can need, I couldn't, I cannot even read it properly. So it's, I think this is the perfect candidate for alias. Do you agree? Uh, so when you run it, uh, if everything is okay then, with the setup and stuff, we should get a host name back. Okay, so this is how it works. And if you think about it, this is really like alternative way to, to get to that without establishing a proper PowerShell session to that machine because that nano server is not even available on the internet. 
I didn't enable it for that. And I still have a commandlet that can reach through the SMT gateway to that machine and execute wherever I want. That's a very powerful thing because I don't need to expose that machine to the internet at all. Thanks to that gateway, I can reach to any of those nodes that are part of the server management tools. So now, sure. So I'm not sure about multi-domain things, but uh, this is so, okay, so this is just a, a test environment that I, I created that domain in Azure instead of my basement. But uh, if I had that on premises, it will also work. The only thing that it's needed for communication is that your SMT gateway machine on premises can communicate to Azure portal. To propagate users? I'm not following you, to be honest. Propagating users, uh, I'm, we, can, we are not talking about directory thing at all here. I mean, can we talk okay, yeah. offline yeah. about this? I just, Sorry. yeah. I will get back to you. It's not that I'm shutting you down, but we will talk about it after session. It's okay. All right. So my my last my last demo today is uh, to look a little bit under the hood of uh, SMT. What uh, kind of uh, BMI WMI classes it's using? So the root uh, management namespace for for it is what you see here: Microsoft Windows Management Tools. So just let's save that in a variable because we're going to reuse it a few times here. So if you look at the, the SIM classes that are available here, you can see um, that they start with Microsoft underscore and then MT for management tools. And there are a lot of them that are used under the hood by SMT. So when you click on something in the portal, it will go through the gateway, connect to the target node using uh, SIM and uh, collect the information. And if you look at the, what kind of BMI providers there are, uh, we have a couple. One is called uh, the registry provider, and the other one. Uh, and you also can see them. Uh, what kind of things are under that uh, that namespace? The great benefit here is that they, they needed to add them to support server management tools. Yeah. But even if you don't want to use server management tools you now have some additional providers in your own system that you can use with SIM, right. which is always great, right? So yeah. that's the great benefit for it. So yeah. I don't care about SMT, but I have now new WMA classes that I can use. Yeah. So it's a separate one for the registry and a separate provider for the management tools. Uh, so for example, if you look at one of the things that we saw, uh, registry tasks, there is a method called search. So we can basically search for a key uh, for uh, demo purposes, searching for WinRM. So if we execute this one, it will go ahead and search on the managed node for uh, for this specific word. I don't know that you used before a PowerShell one-liner to, to search registry for certain keys and values, right? No, I'm not aware of that either. Yeah. So that's pretty powerful. Uh, so if you look further down, for example, the management tools process, uh, it's very similar to what you get from get process. But one thing that we talked about before the session here is that you have this elevated property. So you can actually search for uh, processes elevated. that are not elevated. I'm not right. sure if you can do that using get no, process. I, I was not aware of that before. So there are, the point there is that there are many classes that you can use outside of SMT as well. That's pretty useful. For example, network adapter, uh, memory summary, processor summary. So if you go into the portal and go to a managed node in SMT, for example, this one, uh, in the top here we have the overview and performance, memory, and so on. Here we can see, for example, I think it's processor that comes up here. So all the information that you see in these two are coming from the two classes that I showed you here, processor summary and 
memory summary. So this is things that you can reuse in other scripts as well, inventory scripts and so on. Same for disks. Here you have a disks volume where that you can use in all other things. So one of the things that I used when investigating for doing some research for how this thing works under the hood was to look in the event logs. Uh, there are a couple of event logs to look for uh, to look in. One is for general event WMI activity. You can look into the debug log. So you basically go into the portal and do, do your thing in the GUI and then check out these logs afterwards. So for example, if I go into here and I click on uh, Windows features, uh, roll some features, excuse me. Then you can find it in uh, this log under uh, log what what method was called, for example, get server feature, or if you choose to install a feature from the portal, it will show installed server feature and so on. Uh, and the other one is uh, in a dedicated log for SMT, the SMT gateway, where it, in the debug log, it logs per the whereabouts what, uh, what it's uh, connecting to, for example, in the output here now, we can see that it's been using all of these uh, classes that I just showed you. So it's just how it works under the hood, basically remoting and the same yeah. question. Are you using the event log of the gateway machine or of the, of the managed machine? This is from the gateway machine. The gateway. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And you have always to look into the event log of the gateway, gateway machine. Yeah. He is the, that machine is the executor yeah. of commands. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah, correct. Yeah. All right. That was so my last. Do demo. we have like a three more minutes for one cool demo still? Because we are running here uh, out of time. I mean, but yeah. uh, I think we still have um, container. one container demo that I think uh, can be interesting to you because the idea of this demo will be to um, get the nano container with uh, open source PowerShell on it, and then connect to it with the PowerShell remoting so that you can do testing you know, in a container environment. So let me uh, show you how that works. Uh, so the first thing that uh, you need to do is, or what I did, is I created a Docker file to create an image that I will use to build a container. And uh, let me show you how how it looks like. It's pretty much very easy. I download for, uh, for Docker Hub, I'm downloading the Microsoft Nano Server image provided by Microsoft. I'm adding the current version of the open source PowerShell to it, and then I execute a couple of PowerShell commands during deployment of it. So I block the file and then uh, unzip uh, uh, archive uh, and run a function that is provided by PowerShell team as a part of the open source PowerShell called install PowerShell remoting. The job of that function is actually to create that additional session configuration, this additional uh, remoting endpoint that we will use to connect to open source PowerShell. What is really interesting is to look at that function and you can see that you need like a, just 200 lines of code to create a session configuration, the PowerShell remoting endpoint. And you can actually analyze this uh, function to see how those things are working. I, I really uh, recommend that to you as a kind of a nice exercise. Because uh, if you just, uh, before they open source everything, uh, you will need to do some kind of a reverse engineering to find out how things are working. Now it's just easy to go into code directly and, and see how things are working. So now that uh, I had that image created, before because uh, it needs some time. So uh, I can see I have that in the repository nano with the tag PS6 release 8. So I need to uh, start a container. Interactively, I will remove it when once when I'm done. And what we discovered also is a case sensitive. So uh, try to tag with the all lower case. Otherwise, you need to think about this. And I will start a PowerShell on it. Let me check if everything is okay. Uh, when the run process is done, I should get my uh, nano container that will have inside of it a nano PowerShell that you get with the nano server, and then additionally, open source PowerShell 
there as well, okay? And it will have that additional session configuration that I can use to use PowerShell remoting to go into my container and test open source PowerShell in it, okay? Uh, for demo purposes, this uh, Docker run command always runs a little bit longer. If you try it uh, in a, <laughs> at your home, it will be very fast, but uh, right now it takes some time. So now that I'm there, uh, just to show you that with a host name, that's the random host name that you get in your container. If I run the PS version table, and that's the command that I run the most lately because I'm switching between all these things and I always need to check where I am. Oh. Am I in the full one or open source? So we are now in a full, not full, but nano PowerShell, okay? And I can run get PS session configuration to show you that uh, deployment process created that additional session configuration. In this case, I give it a name PowerShell and then the version number that I have so that I know because sometimes I have even more and I want to kind of switch or do some stuff. So now that we have that container with open source PowerShell in it and additional session configuration, I can switch back to some other environment and just use it to connect to that endpoint. What you need to do is you need to find out the ID of container to use it because uh, we now have two uh, parameters, I think container name and container ID uh, with invoke command that we can, or enter PS session that we can use to go into a container. As they added VM name and VM ID to go into VM with a PowerShell uh, direct, now they added also uh, parameters for going into container. And uh, I will get this ID. Why I'm using PowerShell to get it? Because I cannot remember this. So now that I have that uh, ID, I'm targeting this configuration name that I've created, and I'm running that as admin. So uh, I'm not providing credentials. This is a container, right? So I'm not asked. If I didn't specify run as administrator, then I will go in it as a container user. Now I'm container administrator. And as you can see, the prompt changes. So now I'm inside of a container. And if we check a version of a PowerShell that is available now to us in this interactive session, version table, you can see that I'm now in open source PowerShell and I can just easily test all the features of open source PowerShell inside of my container through PowerShell remoting. So I think it's a pretty cool thing and uh, we have a question as well. Uh, yes, this, this is like an uh, environment for developing and testing things. So I think this is a pretty cool thing to kind of uh, have in your own environment when you want to test it. Once when you're done with it, you uh, close a container and you don't even need to keep it. When you want to test again, you start it. And as I said, uh, in home environment, it starts faster. So you don't need to even wait for it. And you have a really clean experience Every time when they release a new version, you just build a new, you change just the URL for uh, downloading that zip file with the current version and that's it. So everything can be easily automated and uh, available to you. So that's all that we prepared for this session. To you, thank you for your time. And uh, I hope we will see you at our next sessions. I have one on Friday and Jan has one tomorrow. tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Thank you.